Hey everybody, all right. So I tried to record this uh, regularly like I do my lives and it did not work. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and do a pre-recorded for you guys and we're just gonna cut it old school. I'm gonna start from the beginning. So even if you did see the version um, that is on YouTube, the live version, I'm gonna go ahead and start from the beginning anyway, just because you can't, can't do it, I can't do it. All right. So hopefully I can recreate the magic that I was giving you the first time. All right. So you guys know this is a part of my new series that I've been doing called Now That We're Grown, where we sit and discuss movies that we watched as children with our new adult-like eyes, understanding the nuances and the things that we missed as children that really now we see more clearly and we can apply to our own lives in different ways okay so that's kind of why I wanted to start having these conversations about these movies because I watched Wait Until Exhale and it was just like I was watching it for the first time so I was like okay so this is something that I should do right and the first one did really really well Wait Until Exhale um now that we're grown is still up here on YouTube and on my website Bondi Blue bonniebluesshow.com so you guys can check it out if you want to um it it was a really good conversation hopefully this one won't be as long okay so as i set to watch love jones it's one of my favorite movies for a number of reasons the soundtrack being one of the main reasons it's my top three soundtracks i think it's number two after waiting to exhale and then there's soul food and there's some other ones, girl, but I, I can't even think of them right now. But definitely, I'm thinking about Soul Food. And I'm also thinking about doing Soul Food right after this one, Justice for Terry. Um, so, yeah, but Love Jones not only was amazing because of the music and the soundtrack, but also... I. First of all, I love all of the John Coltrane all throughout the movie. It's not a part of the soundtrack and except for In a Sentimental Mood, which is... Um, which is John Coltrane and why am I spacing as if I don't know? Um, and da, 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 Duke Ellington, Duke Ellington. Um, it's one of my, my favorite songs of all time, honestly. And it was one of my favorite uh, songs even before this movie. Like, and I was younger when this movie came out, but my people love jazz. So it's always been one of my favorite songs. Um, and yes, like it, it the vibes of it all, the, the cinematography, the way it shot, the beautiful brown skin black people. Okay, we have soft roller wraps, you know what I'm saying? You know, we have perms with healthy hair, you know, so to speak. We have curly hair, okay? We had Lisa Nicole Carson with dimples and titties. It was everything, you know? We had men with really good mustaches, you know what I mean? Everybody's all young and and just, you know, it's giving everything the vibe, you know, people are smoking cigarettes, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And in poetry bars. It's 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 a time, it's a vibe, okay? Um, but we do not promote the smoking of cigarettes. I'm gonna say it again, just like I said it before. If you look at the screenshot, you guys, um, I'm gonna blow it up because I can on here. Um, if you take a look, okay, at some of the pictures, these are some of my favorite moments from the movie. Uh, this one at the bottom is the last one when they kiss in the rain. Oh my God. And I believe that was John Coltrane playing in the background. That da -na -na -na. Oh my God. It just, it gives me all of the feels y'all. Um, and then, like I said at the top, like, listen, Big Tobacco was definitely a part of like the cool factor in the nineties because they are smoking their lives away somehow making it look sexy, but it is not. And we do not promote it. Okay. But look at the way Nina was looking at him. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, Oh, it's just real sexy all over this movie. And plus I want to point out once again, that if you can take somebody to an old folks place to have fun, where they had where they sell plates and liquor and you could dance, child, it's a good time had by all, and we should always do that. Okay, so if your 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 old man, if you can't take your old man to have fun amongst old people, he may not be the one. So y'all, let's go ahead and get into it. So one of the things that I really um, did not like about Love Jones was how choppy the movie is. It kind of brings us in at the tail end of one relationship 
in one city and then we have skip and jump into another city and we see a relationship grow but we don't really see it grow for real we get montages and bits and pieces we see a marriage break apart and come back together with no real information on what's going down okay but we just see these things happening as if we are kind of like on a train through these people's lives and at some moments the train slows down and you pick up these moments and then it's zooming past and we're missing things so I feel like there were holes in Love Jones, but I also feel like that's what made people want to keep coming back to watch it over and over again because they loved it for the feels and the vibe and the story, but they always felt like they were missing something. So you keep coming back so you could see if you can, you know, just gauge what you missed last time. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like that's what I find when I sit to review things is that I have to watch them very closely. And things that I wasn't paying attention to before, I, I now really get the clear picture of. So Love Jones is one of those movies I think that they created for the smart crowd, the people that are going to actually sit and pay attention to the, the nuances and the jazz references and the 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 um the writer references. There were just so many like beautiful renaissance black artist moments all throughout the movie. I mean... It is, in fact, some type of cinematography of art within itself being art. Like, it's it's crazy. I, this is why I love movies so much. Because of how they're able to not only show you other beautiful forms of art within it, but also become a beautiful form of art itself. So, let's get into it now that I have, you know, wax poetical on y'all. All right? So, Josie is helping Nina move out of her and her ex-man's place, okay? She looks at a picture of her and her ex-man child, Khalil Kanan, who I love. Who I love, girl. Like, I had so many really good wet dreams about him growing up. Um, But, yes, all right? Um, She throws the picture in a box because apparently love don't live here anymore. Josie asks if she's going to give Marcus his ring back, and she says that she would if she knew where the hell he was. But maybe she'll keep the ring as a reminder not to fall in love again because the shit is played out like an eight track. And I'm like, girl, mm, this is the 90s. Because <laughs> it could be played out like a CD in 2022. But you know what, though? This is what I'm going to say about that. This is a this is a sad sign. Listen, girls. Listen, guys. Let me tell you. One relationship going bad does not mean you need to give up on love or feel that being in love or relationships are played. Being in love is an experience. And whether it ends or it goes on until the end of life, whichever it is, it's still an experience to enjoy in the moment. And when it's time to let it go, sometimes it's just time to let it go. And you need to move on to the next love with a fresh start and learning something from the last so that you don't enter into new relationships with the same problems and the same issues. You know, you want to learn from the experiences, but you want to also feel like it's okay for them to sometimes end and then end in heartbreak. Like it's okay. That's life. Just remember the experience, the good times, the times when the sex was good or the vibes were right. And then the times where the shit was bad. What do you learn from the shit that was bad? You know? And then you move on. You exhale that relationship and, and you breathe in fresh air with the new one. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like it's important for young women and young men to not hold on to past pains. Everybody is not the same and life is a journey. So stop looking at every situation where you felt hurt like it's something for you to hold on to. Like holding on. Like no, don't, don't do that. Let that go. <laughs> Learn from it. Let it go. Okay. So they leave from New York and end up in Chicago at a poetry spot named The Sanctuary, y'all. And it's dark fields and it's cold and it's leather and it's dark lipstick colors. It's black eyeliner around the lipstick color. You know what I'm saying? It's giving. You know what I mean? It's browns. It's, it's maroons. You know, it's bourbon. See you know what I'm saying? The colors that we're wearing during this time period. It's just all very, you know, warm. You know what I mean? It's giving. It's giving. It's cold outside, but it's warm on the inside. Okay. Um, so we join the middle of a conversation. And this is another thing I'm talking about with the way this movie kind of hop skips and jumps all over the place because we join in the middle of a conversation between Sheila, Ed Wood and Savan. Okay. 
Ed says that Sheila needs a man to enter the conversation with her. Wood calls himself Mr. Romantic, to which Sheila replies that he is the least romantic man that she knows. Ed says, listen, Sheila, at the end of the day, the cat who had the date on top of the Empire State Building is the one who got hustled like a fool. You watch too many movies, Sheila. So let me break that down for y'all, okay? And then we're gonna have our beautiful inter Darius moment. We're gonna get into that in a second. But this right here, this conversation is a conversation that I feel like we're mimicking even now where men are basically giving women reasons for why they should not have to be romantic with women, why they should not have to be sweet and put for effort in order to procure panties. And, and this is what I need for y'all to understand. No one should have to give you their panties if that's what you want from them. Nobody should have to give you that if they feel like you have not met a requirement level for them, whatever their requirement level is, okay? Romance helps you get the panties, okay? It's small things, all right? Now, this moment where Darius enters the conversation is another one of the moments that I love about Love Jones because it allows for moments to be deep, to breathe, okay? To give you the, the Billy D. Williams effect, if you will, okay? And he was sitting back he hadn't added, everybody's interrupting each other. Everybody's a part of this conversation. Darius is quiet the entire time listening to everybody's perspective. And then when they turn to him and ask him his opinion, he leans in and he says, romance is about the possibilities. From the moment you meet some fine ass babe to the moment you tell her you love her, you know, or the moment you make love to her. That's what he said. And then he says, it's from the moment you propose to the moment that she says, I do. When people say the romance is gone, what they're really saying is that they've exhausted the possibilities, you know, and everybody's like, all right, okay, that's deep. The only person that felt like I felt, which is like, come on, nigga, with this bullshit is Wood. Okay. Now Wood is an asshole. And I, I feel like Wood is the type of man that is the one out of three these days. Y'all are angry at women for some reason. You want women, but you're also haters. Like, it's very weird, like, the way y'all relate to other men in a jealous manner, the way you relate to women in a very disingenuous, um, I just want to have you to show you to other men type of thing. Like, that's a lot of the energy of men these days. And I feel like throughout this movie, we saw everybody, Savan, Ed, Sheila, all hold Wood accountable for being an asshole. Yet these days, I feel like it's more the other way around. Now, Savan and, and Ed and the men that would check a, a Wood are now the one in three, the way Wood was the one in three in the 90s. You see what I'm saying? Like, it, it, even though these men present themselves a certain way as, you know, having their shit together, they're not bums like some of the men of this generation. Like, I don't see any of these men living off of a woman. I don't see any of these men feeling like, you know, they it, it's okay for them to do a woman any kind of way and still have them. Like, they know what they have to do, which is why Wood is single. Because Wood doesn't want to do those things, okay? <laughs> I don't know what's going on with Ed, but we know what Savan's situation is. Savan is trying to make a marriage work. And Darius is trying to actually hold on to a relationship for more than a couple of months. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's, it's men, I feel like, going through the motions of what men go through. Like nobody's perfect, but the energy of it feels more genuine and deeper and, and with more emotional and mental thought. Not, not, not wood, the other ones. <laughs> but like there is, there's a more connection to mental and emotional in these men. And I think that is what we are missing nowadays. Like the depiction of men that are cool, that are sexy, that can both be sweet to women and have some type of emotional intelligence beyond only their own needs in, in every situation. You see what I'm saying? Like men who know how to romance, know how to figure out what the woman needs so that he can get what he wants to get out of her. Not saying that, you know, not to make it sound like it's a using situation, but if you're going to put forth the effort you know what I'm saying that's half the battle for a lot of women you know so I feel like these days there's no romance there's no attempt there's no possibility because you don't provide the action to give the woman the possibility right so throughout your day 
You're in a relationship with somebody throughout your day. You got to like do sweet shit. It doesn't have to be big stuff, but coming home with like candy or, or flowers or food or whatever that she likes. Saying nice shit, babe, you look nice. You know what I'm saying? Like being romantic in small ways throughout your day can have vagina prime juice and ready by the time we get home from work at the end of the day if we're not too tired, okay? And usually we will find a way, even if we are tired, if the energy has been building throughout the day. And that is what the possibility is. Everything I'm doing, I'm doing with the possibility that I could have this experience with this woman by the time I get to the end of my damn work day. Okay? So yeah, Darius is right to an extent, but it's a real deep, cloudy way of saying that effort can get you what you want. So why not provide the effort? And it's because men like Wood only want to do what they want to do. They don't want to put forth effort for a woman to feel, you know, the possibilities of what can happen. They just want a woman to take what they're giving and then give them what they want. And that's childish. And that's not how any of this works. Okay. But I feel like that is the mindset that I, I see and hear more amongst men these days than I heard in movies and television and media in the 90s. It was a more of an understanding that a man had to be a certain way in order to get a woman of a certain caliber or get a woman that he wanted. He had to present himself in a certain way. Nowadays, I feel like men feel the opposite. Like women are supposed to be presenting themselves in a certain way in order to get this man. You know, like men are now more of the prize now. And I feel like it, it, it says something about the time and the lack of thought in, in our art, the lack of emotion, the lack of connection in our art, in the music, in the media. Like people can say what they want to, but that shit affects the way people think about themselves. And so when we have movies like Love Jones that is full of the music and the poetry that is more heartfelt and more genuine to experience and not so... Um, sexual or not so always um material you know what i'm saying like everything is very vapid everything is very harsh these days and i feel like if things were a little bit more softer or or the thought were there if the romance was there you know what i'm saying i think that the relationships that we have and how deep we thought about how we felt um would be a little bit more genuine in this time period than it really is. Cause it's not a lot of it is pump fake. And a lot of it is pretending to feel, you know, to not feel anything when you're feeling everything, you know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely something to pay attention to how the conversations are the same, but the energy of the people is different. You know what I mean? So moving on from there, Darius meets Nina at the bar and she asks what he's thinking about. And he says, a woman I saw once. And she says, oh, she must have been fine. And I love this moment because she was hitting on him first. She noticed him first, but she played it so cool and had that eyebrow raise the entire time. It was more of a come get me energy than a I'm falling all over you energy. And this is the type of shit that I loved about depictions of women in the 90s. Like this, this very much, yes, I'm in control, but still come and get me type of energy. You know what I mean? I love it. I love it because I feel like it is, in fact, the way women um, should carry themselves with men. It should be a hint, but also a pullback. You know what I mean? Because you should control this as a woman. Like you should control this situation. Not men. Men don't know what to do. <laughs> like, I mean, in, in some instances they do. But what I mean is women should always be in control of whether or not they want that energy from somebody or not. You know what I'm saying? Um, it shouldn't just be like open season for that energy from everybody. No, 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 no. I'm going to raise my eyebrows to the person that I want that energy from. I don't want it from everybody. Okay? So I, I love that energy. She, um... Okay, Wood. Wood is at the table hating on Darius, saying that, you know, you can't tell me these girls don't see that slick poetry nigga shit from a mile away. You know what I'm saying? And Sheila and Savannah at the table like, nah, man, you got to give him, you know what I'm saying? Like, you got to give son his props. <laughs> 
And uh, Savon is like, you know, hate is a terrible thing, my brother. Like, I think they said that to him after Darius did his poem, but still the energy was the same. So the whole time Darius is talking to Nina, Wood is over there praying for his downfall. And when he knocks his drink over, reaching to light his cigarette, okay, Wood is like, see, told you, fumble. I was like, he's a hate now. <laughs> like, he's a hate now. Man. Okay, y'all got to pay attention to the niggas that hate and, and try to promote this, I'm not going to be romantic every day. That's some simp shit. Like, the Wood type of dudes, y'all, they're haters. And nowadays, y'all look at them like they're the cool guy, but really, they're the simps because they are jealous of natural, like, attractive energy that another man may have that doesn't require all of this, like, angst and thirst that Wood might have inside of himself. He doesn't he doesn't see all of that when he looks at Darius. Darius just being his cool self and, and gets these women with his genuine energy. And Wood has to pretend to be something in his mind so that those women will come to him. And sometimes it doesn't always work. So he's jealous. These men are the type of men that are going to tell you you're lame when you start to show real consideration and thought for your woman. And they're going to put push that bros before whole shit, which is hilarious because essentially they wish they were in your position, but don't know how to be. It is what it is. So after he fumbles, he goes on stage to perform a, po you know, a poem or a spoken word. And he calls it a blues for Nina, a.k.a. they call me brother to the night. And I'm the blues in your left eye trying to become the funk in your right. And he's just trying to give you injections of sublime erections and get you to dance to his rhythm. <laughs> I'm not going to do the whole poem. OK, I'm not. Nina looked pissed off that he got up there and used her name to talk about fucking her on stage. That's what he did. He got up there and did a whole, you know, lusty, huge vocabulary, you know, quotes from, you know, black authors of the Renaissance time period. Like niggas is our year putting all of their best Mac in a poem to tell you they want your panties. <laughs> and it's so funny because I think there were a lot of women in the audience that were like, oh, Lord, injections, the sublime erections. You know, they was feeling it, you know. But Nina felt embarrassed, felt embarrassed that he got up there and did that, you know. And it, it showed the overzealousness. And it was so funny because Wood was right. Wood was like wonderful. <laughs> like, Wood was hating. But essentially, Wood was the only one that felt like it was on some bullshit. Because essentially, I believe that a hating ass nigga will always be able to find a chink in the armor. And that's what he did. Or, the, you know, I don't want to, you know, what the fuck? Like, y'all know what I'm saying. The, the dent in the armor. Y'all know what I mean. I feel like, you know, you can't even say that no more. And you don't even mean the same thing. Like, I thought that meant like a chain. <laughs> like... Anyway, listen, regardless, all right, regardless, he went on stage, injections of sublime erections, getting hoes to dance to the rhythm. Wood says that he doesn't need poetry to get a woman. Sheila says, yeah, try a personality. And Savan says, yeah, a visa and a breath mint. Nigga, they was playing the fuck out of him. Your breath thing, you ain't got no money and you ain't got no personality. You a hater. So outside, y'all, I'm sorry, these lilies are, are like blooming. They smell really good. Outside the club, Nina comes over to thank Darius for her poem. And he says maybe next week she can write something for him. And she says maybe, but it won't be about sex. And Wood is like, what's wrong with sex? And she says there's nothing wrong with sex, but there are just other topics. And everybody's like, what? So she goes over to Darius and she writes something on his hand. And y'all know back in the day, people would assume it's a phone number. But when you look, it says love. And everybody was like, oh, you know, she plays you, son. Oh, you thought you was going to get a phone number. Oh, and then, you know, she walks away and Josie's like, good night, black people. You know, it's real, it's real, it's real sexy. You know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, yeah, Wood is like, I'd be in her car right now. It's like, Wood, no, you wouldn't. You'd be walking back to your car by yourself like you're going to do right now. <laughs> Talking all of that shit, you know what I'm saying? And Darius was like, y'all just mad somebody approached me. <laughs> Too funny, y'all. So Nina is hating. 
and kind of sucking at her job as a photographer's assistant, okay? She is rolling her eyes at the man all day, and then she goes to get his lunch, comes back. It's not what he wanted. He was just like, listen, maybe you don't have the temperament for this job. Maybe you'd be better off on your own. And honestly, yeah, yeah, you don't need to be an assistant, Nina. Go try to be a photographer on your own because the energy was given, I do not want to be here. Ugh. <laughs> So Darius is also quitting his job so that he can work on the book that he's writing. And I'm like, they're both in this same space where life is kind of up in the air. They have these dreams that they're going after. And that's another thing that I want to highlight, you guys. I want to highlight the fact that there are two people who both have dreams for themselves and they're both going after those dreams. Like, that's another thing I feel like the 90s did a beautiful job of doing was not making women have to give up their dreams for love make you know making it so that women had the space to have the careers that they wanted for themselves while simultaneously being in the relationships that they wanted to be in um we say we saw a lot of depictions of that in the 90s more so than I feel like I'm I don't know what it is about this period now where I feel like it's anti whatever they were throwing out there in the 90s, you know? Now they want y'all to, you know, go find a man and take care of y'all like it's the fucking 60s or something like that. Whereas in the 90s, it's like, no, do your own thing. <laughs> do your own thing. So um, Nina goes to Sheila's record store because she's in desperate need of an Isley Brothers CD. Child, listen, I always come back to you. I'll always come back to you. I won't do it, but that's my shit, okay? Listen, so Darius comes in behind her, and Sheila was like, you know, your girl back there. And so she's in the back, and he go back there, and he was like, hey, you know, we keep running into each other. And he asked if he can play her something. And she's like, I don't know, because the last time you went on an impulse, you embarrassed the shit out of me. Letting him know that that poem about having sex with her did not make her feel good. I mean, it probably made her undergarments wetting a little bit. But also, like, I'm a woman. Respect me, okay? <laughs> like, women really didn't like for their shit to be thrown out there in public places like that. Like, don't do me like that. You don't talk about fucking me. You talk about fucking me in private, okay? But anyway... He puts on a Charlie Parker record for her and she recognizes it and starts to speak. And he's like, Shh, listen, and it almost felt like she about to cuss him out, but she allowed him the space and she actually listened. And honestly, I loved it. It made me uh, also add Charlie Parker to my jazz uh, playlist. But anyway, so they listen and the song sounded sad to her. And he says, not sad, melancholy, maybe, but not sad. And she says, maybe you're right. He asks her out, but she says that the timing is wrong and she leaves. But when she's leaving, she kind of turns her head and she looks back and I'm like, girl, you wanted him to chase behind you or something. Uh -huh. See, this is how you play hard to get y'all. You keep telling a nigga no and then he got to be all, you know, if he really trying to fuck with you and he really worth you doing all of that, he going to try again. Okay. Y'all, this is, this, this is the type of energy I'm on. Nigga, you got to try hard to date me. <laughs> like I'm, I'm not, I'm not easy to procure out here. Okay. I love it. Okay. Sheila tells Darius that, you know, he moved too fast women like it nice and slow i'm like child some of us really do and i was just listening to that before i came up here it's seven o'clock gonna die i'm in my drop top cruising the streets oh yeah i got a real pretty pretty little thing that's waiting for me i pull up anticipating good love don't keep me waiting. Oh, don't make me do it. It's nice and slow. Plans to put my hands in places I never seen. Girl, you know what I mean. Take it to a place nice and quiet. There ain't no one there to interrupt. Ain't got a rush. I just want to take it nice and slow. <laughs> I've been waiting, buddy, for so long. Making love until the sun comes up, baby. Listen, that's my song. Okay, I'm sorry, but I had to give it to y'all because, you know, nice and slow. <laughs> like, not nice and slow, okay? 
He asked to see her address, which is written on the check that she gave to Sheila. And Sheila is like, no, what if her man comes to the door? And he says, you right, I'm bucking. Then the next thing we know, he knocking on her door with the Isley Brothers CD she was looking for. And she was like slightly freaked out, like, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> And he was like, listen, listen, I just wanted to give you the Isaac Brother CD or whatever. You know, that's the one. And she was like, yeah, you know, that's the one. And he was like, oh, okay, you know. And she was like, what, you trying to come in? And he was like, I mean, you know, if you ain't, you know, you, you know. <laughs> and she was like, okay. And she lets him in. I'm like, girl, why would you let him in your apartment? This shit is crazy. First of all, he got your address off the back of a check. Somebody to call the police on Sheila. Second of all... Okay, then he show up at your apartment, stalker. All right, she let him in, y'all. Listen, I would have been scared. I wouldn't have let him in my house because I would have been nervous that he was on some creepy shit. Like, you just can't trust niggas these days. So I, this is a moment that I felt like, uh, no. <laughs> this wouldn't have went down around my neck of the woods. I would not have let you in my house, good sir. Um, But either way, I mean, I guess she felt like, I've seen him around, but I still feel like that don't mean he's safe just because you've seen him around, girl. But either way, either way, he sees that she's a photographer and she asked, you know, why he's why he's there. You know what you're doing here? He says that he thought if he would ask her out again, maybe she'd change her mind. And she's like, oh, OK, you a persistent black man, you know, and everybody likes persistence. At least I do. Then he mentions something about her photography and she says that he's a renaissance black man. And then he references a, a quote by Mozart that Nina lets him know it's actually George Bernard Shaw. She says, see, now you're trying too hard. It's like, girl, he been trying too hard. He been trying too hard ever since he did that poem on stage talking about a blues for Nina. Trying to become the, the, the you know, the, 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 the whistle and a thump and a thigh and all of this shit. <laughs> okay, listen. Trying to become the funk and you're right, bitch. Okay, ever since he was, you know, talking about becoming things in your thighs and shit. Girl, it, it's been trying hard, girl. It's been giving that. She tells him that, you know, she'll go out with him. But next time he want to drop by, he should call first since she know he got the phone number too. Mm -hmm. He was like, you right. I got your number. I was like, oh, it's cute. I like it. I hate it that I like it, but it's cute. And so then um, they go on a, a date and it's Savon's house. They go over to Savon's house and Wood, Sheila, Ed, uh, Savon and his wife are there and Wood is making comments about the way his wife cooks and she says I know Wood not talking with his microwave cooking is all right Savon plays the drum and Sheila gets into a little uh, uh, uh. you know what I'm saying it's like look at us pregnant with that shit and it was just like listen Sheila's beautiful and I'm just saying I feel like I've seen Sheila recently and Sheila still looks really good okay Sheila asks Wood if he's scared of God. And he says he knows God. And Sheila says, God is a woman, honey. And Darius is like, yeah, yeah, God is a woman. And, of course, Wood and all of the men are looking at him like, nah, bro, come on now. <laughs> come on. We know you, you know what I'm saying? But come on, bro. Like, don't bullshit a bullshitter, okay? And Darius says, no, when you look at the way women control with their sex, it must be God. You know what I'm saying? The way women can render a man completely, you know, weakened at the knees you know man would never allow a creation made in his own image to get jammed up like that that's what he said sheila says that she uh sheila says uh-uh why are you trying to impress your dates all right savan comes in to save the day and say let me break it down so it can subsist <laughs> let me try that again okay savan comes in and says let me break it down so it can consistently and forever be broke okay that's a that's a line i love to throw out there like that anyway and he says basically when a man gets a hard on you know where the blood comes from head feet so one he's dumb two he can't run Obviously, that's something that God came up with. Only a woman God would think of some shit like that. <laughs> and then Wood says, "Now nah, I got it. Because if God really was a woman, you know what? You know how a lady thinks she'd have put the dick right under the chin. <laughs> Y'all know like that. You know what I'm saying? Like that. Um, that shit was hilarious to me. I'm still laughing about that. Okay. After Darius and Nina walk and talk about poetry then decide to go bump and grind at the reggae spot, child. That was, oh, you are my lady. 
I hate that this song wasn't on the soundtrack. I really feel like they should have put the the song they was dancing to at the reggae club on the soundtrack. Yeah, that was a, that shit was a bop. But before I move on to the rest of the date, that conversation about God, I personally feel like God can't just be a man. God is either both or a woman, in my opinion. Um, and for a, a number of reasons, like it, I feel like nature, I feel like the way women seem to have more of a balance within themselves. I feel like the way women are more likely in society to be um, inclined to be worried about their spirit. Um, I don't see a lot of men in that space. I don't see, not really. It, it's only in church and that's in a controlling way. I don't see a lot of men in the space. And I'm talking about men walking around everyday life of being connected to spirit in a real way to me. It's always in a way of let's be a part of a religion that controls women. Let's be a part of a, you know, like a religion that exalts men and, and makes men feel better about themselves. And it's just very unbalanced and one-sided in my opinion. The fact that there is no representation of feminine in spirit in Christianity or in any of the other Abrahamic religions just says a lot to me about what those religions were created for. I believe in God, but I don't know if we believe in the same God, child. <laughs> I'm going to just go ahead and say it like that. Um, so Nina and Zarius take their walk, right? And after the reggae spot, they get back to her place and he gives her an old nasty tongue kiss, y'all. It was like, ugh. But, you know, it was, it was a rush. And she was like, listen, I can't go out like that on the first date. Because, you know, us girls got class. We can't be fucking you on the first date unless we really like you. So he walks away. He goes to his bike and then he turns around. Listen, uh, what he said, he was like, um, I, I just want to come up to talk. And they both kind of laugh because they know that's not true. <laughs> they both laugh, y'all. They both laugh because they know it's not true. So she just says, all right, you know, come on. And y'all, we have one of the best, sexiest, up close sex scenes I have ever seen. To one of the best remixes of a song for a soundtrack. Because something, something, y'all know is an upbeat song. They remixed it and called it the Mellow Smooth for this one. And it is literally one of my favorite songs of all time. Something, let me break you off, baby, break you off something, so if that's cool, baby, I want you, I want you, I love a while, <clears throat> Till the police come through, oh, oh, baby, do a little something with you, boy, yeah, sweet baby. Oh, come on, uh, y'all. It's everything. The sex was everything. Close shots, dark moments where both of them had their mouth on the other person, child, you know, knee alone's nipples, areolas, okay? Like, it was everything. <laughs> like, it was just a beautiful sex scene, the way they cut it together, the music, the vibe of it, like, it was, the, you know, the way you can imagine it happening. Girl, sexy, 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 okay? To the point that the next morning, Darius is up in the kitchen cooking cheese omelets, okay? <laughs> All right? In the kitchen, wrist, twisting like a stir fry, whip it, okay? She assures him that nothing that happened was something that she didn't want to happen, meaning that she really wanted to have sex with him, which is why she had sex with him. And now she doesn't regret having sex with him. Not at all. And he was making omelets and he gave her something. He was like, well, I'm about to, you know, fix me something. You want anything else? And she was like, don't say that. <laughs> I was just like, that's all shit I'd say. Look, don't, don't ask that question. <laughs> don't ask that question. Okay, listen. And you know what I'm saying? He was like, is there something else you need? And it was like, oh, we're about to get into it again. Oh, my God. I love it. All right. So 
she talks to Josie about it. Um, but she wasn't really trying to tell Josie that she had sex with him on the first night. But Josie kind of picked up on it and was like, I can't believe you fucked him on a first date. You ho. And she knew that everybody would feel like this. <laughs> like, which is why she didn't want to have sex with him on a first date. But she was just like, I didn't plan on it, but it just happened. She was like, yeah, you slipped and fell on his dick. And it's just like, listen, <laughs> I may not have slipped and fell, but bitch, it felt real slippery and bitch, I might have fell. Josie wants the dick details. Okay, how big, how long, all of that. And Nina says, I, girl, listen, I can't even describe it. It was like his dick just talked to me. Josie said, what did he say? She said, Nina, ooh, ooh, girl. But it ain't no love thing. We just kicking it. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> girl, I was just like, the way you just talked about that man dick, that man dick touch your soul. Ain't no we just kicking it. <laughs> that was cute though, girl. That was cute. That was cute though, girl. Okay, anyway, y'all, just get a little greasy. I'm like, girl, why you getting greasy? You know what I'm saying? Anyway, so Savan's wife is leaving the house abruptly with their child. Get your shit together, Savan, trifling ass, okay? And he says that if she would have tried to save some damn money, maybe they wouldn't be going through this shit. So whatever they going through, child, we don't know, but it got something to do with money and he trifling and he need to get it together and her and the baby leaving and it look crazy, okay? Here come Darius, like, you know. See you later, Troy. Darius, talk to your homeboy. What's up, bro? He, uh, what? He's like, we supposed to go bowling. He was like, I know that. He's like, play pool. Something, you like, we'll go, go play pool. But it was the way he was like, you know, I know that. Like, nigga, you just asked what I'm doing here. <laughs> like, I told you, know, like, we had plans. I know that. So they go and play pool, right? And um, Darius asked if he's with his soulmate. And so they talk. And Savan says, does he love his wife? Hell yeah. Is she here? Fuck no. <laughs> he said, people with profound insights on life know not to get married. And those who do, they know marriage is what you make it. And I'm like, that is very real. That is very real. Savan says, why you asking? It's that girl Nina, huh? And, you know, it suffice to say that she put it on him, okay? The Undun, the Oriba, the Orishas, the Yoruba. She put all of that good God-like pussy on this man, okay? Um, he was up making cheese omelets. But once again, swearing that it ain't a love thing, they just kicking it. Savon so says one thing about it. When that Jones comes down, it be a mother. And I was just like, that that boy over there hurting because that lady left. That <laughs> son over there need a hug, okay? Darius brings Nina to his place and um, forgot, I guess, that there was a picture of him and his old girlfriend on his desk. So he hurry up and put the picture down. And it was his ex, Felicia. Then Nina starts asking him to take his clothes off and she starts taking pictures of him and shit. And we just... The, it's the sexual chemistry, y'all. It's the montage of the sexual chemistry, the the kicking it, the hanging together, the, you know what I'm saying, the, this picture up here. You know what I'm saying? Like, is it this picture? Is it this picture? I can't remember. I know for sure, like, they was just vibing and having a lot of sex. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then here comes her ex, Marvin, coming out of fucking nowhere. Nigga, I left you in New York somewhere. I didn't know where you was, and you gonna pop up on my doorstep in Chicago? The fuck? Okay, he said he's made some mistakes. He's sorry. He has a train ticket to New York and he wants to try again. And she says that he had all that and he didn't know what to do with it. And he's like, well, I want it again. And I'm just like, how like selfish, how entitled of you to come back into this woman's life after you decided to disappear on her to tell her that you want to try again. So that means she need to pack her shit and come back to New York with you. The audaciousness. It's ridiculous. Okay. She says she doesn't owe him shit. He's talking about that's the least you owe me. I don't owe you a motherfucking thing. Are you serious? I wouldn't have went back just for that. Just for that type of language, I wouldn't have come back. Because, see, your mind ain't right. Nina talks to Josie about it. And Josie gives her some bad advice and tells her to tell Darius. And if Darius acts a fool, that means that there's no need to go. But if he act all cool about it, then take your ass to New York and see what's up with Marvin. Okay? 
Plus, Nina has some old contacts, so she's trying to see if she can get a job out there. So, after her and Darius have another sex session, she tells him. And he tells her to do what she wants to do. He not her man. And then he takes his ego to Savan. He says, I don't... I, oh, yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, all right. So, after... They had sex. She told him he played it cool. He acted like he didn't care. And she was like, I'm, you know, telling you all of this, that I'm going to look for jobs and that I'm going to see what's up with my ex because I wanted to be honest with you. And he was like, it ain't nothing. But it really was. So I feel like there was a moment where she was trying to be emotionally honest with him. But also at the same time, she wasn't being emotionally honest because if she would have told him, you know, why you don't, you know, why you don't care? Like, then she would have had to admit that the relationship was more. So because everybody's lying about what the relationship is, what they want it to be, to save face, to play it cool because they don't want to rush into it, but they still feel in a way. Honestly, I feel like she should have still made that decision, but it shouldn't have been based on his reaction. It should have been based on what she felt like she needed to do for herself, okay? So anyway, like I said, Darius takes his ego to talk to Savan about it, okay? He says, I still, I don't get stolen. But he obviously feels a way about her leaving to go and be with another dude. Savan reminds him they was just kicking it like he said. And he says, that's not the point. He says, it wouldn't be so bad if I didn't think she was the one. And Savan was like, <clears throat> the one? Nigga, what? You know what I'm saying? And he laughs and plays it off. And Savan is like, uh-huh, yeah, okay. Yeah, all right. He was like, bro, what you talking about? I'm a thief in the night. You know what I'm saying? He's like, I'm a player, nigga. My feelings, the one. Nigga, what? Walks off to the bar, face goes, mm. went from what to, mm. which tells us that you really did feel that way about her. And Savan is right to think that you on bullshit, okay? But when he goes to the bar, he sees another pretty woman to bury his sorrows in. And to me, that's what a lot of men do. Men have the capability of compartmentalizing. Yes, I'm hurt over the woman that left, but I can still lay up under this other woman and make my worries go away and get my frustrations out on her. Nina called and left a message on his answer machine telling her that she was about to get on the train to go to New York and maybe he would want to see her off. And I guess he was like, fuck her because he's mad that she's going to go and see what's up with her ex. So he and this girl, Lisa are in his apartment about the fuck as he's listening to the girl on the answering machine. And you can see their mouths moving. You couldn't hear what they were saying. And this is when the music comes into play. You know, that good old blues music. It feels like rain. Okay? And the guy, I mean, she, Lisa says to him, who's that? And Darius says, nobody. And I was just like, oh, okay, that's what we're on. Fine. <laughs> that's what we're on. Okay. So Nina has some job interviews for her photography and it's basically white men telling her that her photography needs to be more polished. It means that it probably needs to not depict the black people that we saw, which are like regular hood people, but in, in their beauty, you know what I'm saying? Like these beautiful hood people in, you know, just being smiling, living, you know what I'm saying? And there was absolutely a beauty in the roughness and the grittiness of it. And that is the type of photography that she does, you know, it's given Gordon Parks. So um, she gets home after dealing with the microaggressions of white people trying to find a job. And Marvin is complaining about her eating the last box of cereal because he had a bad day. And she was like, well, I had a bad day too. He was like, well, you want to talk about it? She was like, no. Okay. And he's saying that he doesn't want her to worry about finding a job because he doesn't want her to worry about rejection. But to me, it sounds as if... He didn't want her to follow her dreams because he wanted her to be sitting at the house waiting on him. And that's not something that she really wanted. Whereas with Darius, there is the space to do exactly what she wanted to do because he wasn't putting those types of confines on her because he wanted to, you know, figure his career out too. So I, I almost feel like it was showing her that the relationship that she wanted with Marvin wasn't really what she wanted for herself. It's what Marvin wanted for her. And at least when she was with Darius, she was able to be however she wanted to be. You know what I'm saying? There was an openness in that. So I think she was able to see the relationships more clearly. And she says that she doesn't know why she's there. And he says, what about after all these years? Now you don't know why you're here? She was like, all we have, Marvin, is all these years. And it's just not enough anymore. 
So the next morning, Nina leaves her ring on his finger and goes back to Chicago, girl. And she went to Chicago from the train station to the sanctuary looking for Darius. Okay, Josie was like, girl, I know you came here looking for Darius, but he ain't here, so let's go ahead and leave. On the way out, Wood tries to holler at them, but it's like, no, thank you, Wood. <laughs> go on, on to your, your hearse, sir. Go, go on and go on to your hearse. Actually, Nina meant to call Darius the next day, but she was at the bookstore and saw him there with that girl, Lisa, that he had met right after she told him that she wanted to go to New York. So he's been dating the Lisa girl. And when she saw that, that made her not want to call him. You know, you with another girl. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave you where you at. Wood. Okay. Wood comes around at the girl job. Okay, trying to holler at her, trying to purchase, um, because y'all know she takes pictures of children. She does uh, photography as a job now. So now she's taking pictures of folks. Y'all want to do y'all headshots? Come on down, Nina, let her do them. So he come up there talking about, you know, immortalize my shit. And I'm just like, oh, wow, you really going to spend up all your money at this lady's photography um, studio so that you can get a date? So he asked for one date and she obliges. They go on a date. He got jokes, you know, talking about how bloomers are for big girls and she should wear a thong and how he don't wear drawers at all. And a lot of the conversation is crass. The, a lot of the conversation is not that deep. It's about sex, but a man who can make you laugh. Like, <laughs> that's the thing. He's already kind of lame, but because he can make you laugh, women will kind of be like, okay, well, he's not that bad. At least I was laughing. But if the jokes are at somebody else's expense, he's probably not a good guy. So Darius has writer's block, okay? Masterpiece of minimalism, as he called it. Savon calls to tell him that Nina is back in town. And he's like, yeah, I know. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you something you didn't know, brother. Okay? And Savon, messy ass, tells Darius that Nina and Wood had been seen around together. Sheila and Darius are at the sanctuary talking about how Sheila never has food at her parties when Wood comes in. And this was like, y'all know that scene that they always show from uh, the, the call service movie um, that was kind of weird that Lakeith Stansfield was in. He was like, brother, I hope you have a spectacular day in all your future endeavors. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're going at each other, but it's, it's saying positive things to each other. That was almost the energy of this. Where it's about to be heavy shade, but we ain't going to really show you that it's shade. It's, it's the nicest of the nastiest for men is how it felt. It felt like nice, nasty for men. Okay? And, you know, he comes slinking his ass in there, and Sheila was kind of like, you know... Mm, here come this nigga and she looks at Darius she's like I heard about what happened and Darius is like you know it's cool man I ain't tripping I'm always cool you know what I'm saying so he come over there with his sunglasses on what's going on D you know what I'm saying like trying to stunt on a son right it was like really what like what sat down to gloat okay he got a new gig keeping him up working all through the night Darius says oh I know about that type of gig used to work the hell out of it you think you can handle it? And then Wood gets a page and says, I think I might have it handled. And Darius says, Mom, keep paging you, huh? <laughs> and he, he says, not this time, Darius. And Darius points out how he, you know, never can keep a job. He always end up getting fired. But see me, I quit mine. You know, and then he laughs at him like, nigga, you so whack. And he walks off. And Sheila tells Wood he ain't shit for using that girl to compete with Darius. And, you know, he's like, come on now, you know, like a little, uh, come on now, you know you need a massage. Like, it was just stupid. It was stupid. But Wood ain't shit. But because Wood is funny, I think everybody let Wood get away with being, you know, like an asshole. You you doing, using this woman to, to measure your dick with, with Darius? Like, Really? You're in competition with a man that's not even paying attention to you like that. So, you know, you're in competition with Darius. Darius is not, not in competition with you. Anyway, so Wood brings Nina to Sheila's party, unbeknownst to her. She's like, where are we going? He was like, oh, we going to chill. A couple of people I know. And Nina walks in, sees the click. She's never been to Sheila's house, so she didn't know. So she looks around and then Darius comes running in talking about the slop and it all sets in what's happening here. And she says, hey, Sheila, where's the bathroom, girl? She was like, oh, it's upstairs. Right? 
She goes upstairs. She gives him the eye on the way up. And everybody like, really, bruh? You ain't shit. Like, everybody in the room is looking at Wood like he ain't shit, right? <sighs> Darius comes in, sees Wood, and then Nina, who now wants to go home. I forgot, yeah. Darius came running in after she went upstairs. So she comes downstairs, and she sees him, and she's like, fuck. <laughs> shit. Just embarrassing and shit. So she's like, can you talk to me outside, Wood? And Wood goes outside, you know what I mean? And she was like, if you and Darius want to see whose dick is bigger, you can do it without me. Take me home. And he's like, take you home? Come on, like, you ain't know they was going to be here. She was like, I don't give a shit about all that. Take me home. And he was like, no. She was like, wow, unbelievable. So she leaves. He runs back inside. And when everybody realizes that he came inside without her, they like, you left the woman outside, Wood? He was like, man, fuck her. And Darius was like, wow, son. So Darius goes to get his coat, bumps the nigga on the way out, and goes to run after her. He's like, oh, oh, Nina, hold up. And she walking, she mad. And he was like, hold up, okay? Now, the last thing you want is to be out here this late, stomping up and down the street like somebody that stole your fucking bike. Now, let me take you over here to the payphone. We can get you a cab, and I'll let you go on your merry way. I just want to make sure you are right. And, um... First of all, the stomping down the street like somebody stole your fucking bike is one of the funniest lines that nobody ever tried to be funny. <laughs> Y'all laugh at that shit every time I hear it. It, is, it lives rent-free in my mind, first of all. Second of all, a man that is that worried about you, that he's like, hey, hey, fuck all that. I don't care what's going on with you and this nigga. I don't care what's going on, but I do want to make sure you get home safe, even if that nigga don't want to make sure you get home safe. That shit is attractive. That shit is attractive, okay? So we waiting for the car to come in. Um, what do he say? He's like, um, he asked how she's going to come back and not call and then hang out with his homeboy and shit. And I'm like, y'all was standing there that whole time saying nothing, and he waited until right when the cab pulled up to ask her that question. And she was like, you could have told me you were seeing another woman. And he was like, what you talking about? I ain't seeing nobody. She was like, you know what I'm talking about, okay? I saw you at the bookstore with a girl, and at first he couldn't remember. And then he thought about it. He was like, oh, shit, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lisa. Yeah, that's what happened. So one rainy night, they both were thinking about each other. And they both pick up the phone. And I guess she picked up the phone to call first. So when he picked his phone up, he was like, hello? And she was like, hello? And then they realized it was one another. And he was like, damn, we was thinking about each other at the exact same moment. Everybody knows that whenever that happens, it makes you feel away. Okay. Everybody knows that whenever that happened, it makes you feel away. When I tell you me and Lyric do that all the time. But anyway, um, she says that she wanted to apologize about the other night and that she didn't know that he was going to be there. And he says he ain't tripping. And she says she has two tickets to the steppers. A party event or whatever and ask if he want to go if he can step and he was like yeah I could do a little thing so they go out and they step you know what I'm saying and I loved it they tear it down with the old folks I loved it you know what I'm saying with the hard hairstyles and shit twisting and everything they was cute it was everything okay so after he assures her that the situation with Lisa was nothing which we know it was just something to bide his time and he tells her, you know, it's a destiny type thing between me and you. You know what I mean? And it's funny because I feel like there's a part of him that thinks he's saying it to Mac on her. But it absolutely is a real thing that they keep coming back to each other. So they go back to her place and she doesn't want to have sex, even though they have already had sex repeatedly. And they try to stay apart, you know, with her upstairs in her bedroom and him downstairs on the sofa. And they playing that jelly roll killed my papa. You know, it has a build up in the music. So like as they're up there getting hot and shit. And he he was like, I can't take this shit. So he goes up there. And, you know, she was like, you know, I'm not asleep. You know, she wasn't bothered. He was like, can I play something for you? And she says, yeah. And so... He puts on In a Sentimental Mood, y'all. It's my favorite song, y'all. I love that song so much. Dun, 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 dun. And then we get another montage. Um, this is the montage that I was thinking about at the beginning of the video. Like, because they always want to throw you a montage in there. But this montage was longer. This montage was the dance and then all of the romance. It wasn't the sex like the first time. The first time it was all about the sex. This time was more about the romance. You know what I'm saying? It was about 
them spending time together. Look, the picture of them smoking, you know, the cigarette, the way she was looking at him, hanging with Savon and his new old lady, you know, just running in a park. They were spending all of this time together in a way that was really a relationship. You see what I'm saying? Different from the first time, which was more about sex. But somehow we end up in a disagreement anyway. I don't know how. And that's what I'm talking about. Like, we see them being together. We see it being a relationship. We see, you know, the music is playing, y'all. It's giving us everything we want. And then one night she's laying in the bed. And he gets a call from Lisa at 5 o'clock in the morning and actually gets up to go and talk to her. There was another time when she came home from a walk taking pictures. And Lisa's phone number is on the refrigerator as if, you know, she's not basically living there with him. So it, it seemed like he was still doing things that made her feel like the relationship still isn't as serious because why would you keep this girl's number on the refrigerator? Why are you answering this girl's calls at 5 a.m.? And Nina isn't the type to say shit when it happens. You know what I'm saying? Like she's just gonna focus on what makes her feel good in a relationship and that's the sex. So even though she's seeing these red flags, at the end of the day, the sex. You know what I'm saying? So we just gonna hunch and then, you know, it is what it is. Um, but eventually the conversation happens, right? And she's feeling away, he's feeling away. They're both trying to work on their separate things, kind of sitting in the house bored. And an argument starts, right? Regular argument. He says that she's the one that went to New York and fucked old boy, hung out with my homeboy, partied and shit. She says he acted like he didn't even care that she went to New York. And he says that she could come and get her shit. Like, just broke up with her. Like, out of nowhere, they're having a disagreement about basically how they got back together without discussing her going to New York and how he felt about that. Or discussing how she felt about this Lisa girl who he said was nothing, but as we see, you're you're still talking to her. So it's it has to be something if, if you know, you're still talking to her. And honestly... I think it wasn't that he wanted to be with her. It was that the both of them kept a foot outside of the relationship in some capacity. I don't know why. And I can't even really understand how we how that showed up until this moment. That they both kind of kept one foot out of the door in the relationship. Um, because he was still holding on to shit and she was ignoring shit, but still feeling a way. You know what I'm saying? But he was just basically like, you can come get your shit from my place and we can just let it be what it is. So she does. And when she, you know, is leaving, she, I guess, was hoping that they would have some type of conversation. And he tells her to shut the door on the way out like he don't give a fuck. And she was so sad. Like, you could see it in her face. And he was just, I don't give a fuck. Ego, right? So Darius talks to Ed about only getting one or two true loves and feeling like he fucked it up. And Ed is like, man, love is with whom you make it and what you make it, which is true. But the chemistry and the energy that you get from a person is extremely important. And you're not going to feel like that about everybody, which is why it's important to not squander those relationships by not being careful with the way you treat a person. And I feel like, in essence, Darius wasn't being careful with Nina. Like, you asked her for this. You asked her for what she's giving you, but yet you're still mad about what happened. So you still keeping this girl's number on the refrigerator. You still talking to this girl. You still leaving space for this girl who you said wasn't even that important, which means that in some way you felt like you needed to keep an upper hand on her. You weren't treating her well. And I think she was ignoring the things that she was seeing and, uh, just wanting to be with him. Like a lot of the times, as much as it seemed as if he was doing extra shit to get her, she was the one that was looking at him in the moments when he wasn't paying attention. You know, it seemed as if she was more in love with him from the beginning than she ever really said or allowed herself to be. And I think that's probably what it was. Like, I think we feel, we feel things from each other before we communicate it. And I think he felt that she was like withholding and so he was also withholding they were both doing the same thing but I think at moments she was giving and he was as a man being more ego driven you know even though they were both kind of at one point or another missing each other I don't know if anybody else has been in relationships like that where you're constantly like almost missing each other in a relationship 
you only have certain moments where both of y'all are completely into each other and there's no issue. Otherwise, there are moments where you're in it and they're not and then they're in it and you're not, you know, like that type of thing happens in relationships. And I feel like they just kind of kept missing each other, even though they would kind of come together and have these incredible moments that held them together. But ultimately, like, you know, they, they just kept butting heads, I think, because they weren't being real with each other about how they truly felt because they were holding on to shit from past relationships and holding on to ego and all of that type of shit, which is bad for relationships, especially men. When you really love a woman or when you found a woman who you really want to be with, you have got to take your ego out of the situation. You really, really do. Women, I feel like more so need to keep ego to protect themselves because men are finic finicky, you know what I'm saying? And fickle. And I think that when women decide that they want someone, they are way more intentional. It's way harder to, to move their gaze when they're really serious about a guy. Whereas like Darius, very serious about Nina, but there's still another girl in the picture. Like, see what I'm saying? They both felt the same way, but men have the ability to still compartmentalize and find some other girl to always keep in a mix so that he can keep a separation. Whereas Nina is putting up boundaries to protect herself, but there's no other guy. There's no other person there to take her attention away from Darius. You know what I'm saying? So we see, we see Savan and Troy get back together and Savan thanking God that his wife is walking back into the house with their son. And, you know, she touches his face and it just shows that somehow Savan and Troy found their way back to each other. We don't know what happened, you know what I'm saying? But there was something about the feeling of that woman walking back in and, and touching her man's face and him seeming so grateful to have her back, where at one point they were so mad and angry and over each other. But the love and, and gratefulness for each other in that moment, this is what I loved about Love Jones, because we didn't even have to see all of the story in order to feel what was meant for us to feel from Savan and Troy's relationship. So y'all, Darius um, isn't happy without Nina either. We see him writing and then having that writer's block and throwing the fucking, you know, uh, um, typewriter across the room. And it's because he's trying to, he's trying to ignore what he's feeling and he can't, it hurt. You know, you could tell like the moment where he just stopped and, like he was breathing, you could tell, because he was typing off fast and, just, ugh, and then pushes it. And then you could tell, like, that's a man trying not to let the pain, the pain, because it's not anger. It looks like anger, but what that man was feeling was pain. Meanwhile, Nina is taking pictures of the fucking ceiling and internalizing and trying to find a way to move on from what happened, you know? So Josie calls Darius one night and says, hey, I don't think that Nina wants you to know this, but I think you should know. At first he thought something was wrong, but when he understood that, you know, she was okay, he was like, man, what the fuck? Like, what you want? Had attitude. And Josie was like, listen, she's leaving on a noon train tomorrow to go to, you know, New York or DC for a job with Vibe magazine. I think you should see her off. He was like, well, maybe not. She was like, well, listen, I just thought that you should know. Hung up the phone. He sat there and waited until the last minute and then he ran to go and see her. By that time, she was already on the train and his ass was running after that train just so he could try to get her attention so that they, she could see that he showed up. Even if he was late, I showed up, I'm here. But too little, too late because she didn't see you and that train went off and a year goes by and Nina comes back to Chicago for work. Because now she's really, you know, she's working. She's busy. She's a photographer for Vibe Magazine. And she's got a shoot in Chicago. And Darius just finished his book, Gypsy Eyes. And, you know, like, it, it, Gypsy Eyes, when I looked it up, beautiful eyes, um, a woman that is alluring around the eyes. Like, I definitely feel like that's a representation of Nina and maybe how he saw her. So I think that this woman in essence became a muse for him in one way or another, because a year later that book is, is done. And the title of the book makes me feel like it has something to do with their relationship. And Savan asked why he never called Nina. He says he wrote a lot of letters to her, but he never mailed them. However, he did quit smoking. 
Nina goes to the sanctuary to perform for the first time and we didn't see Darius in the room. She was like, you know, I wrote this for somebody and um, I was hoping that they would be here, but I don't see them. And so she goes on to read a Sonia Sanchez um, poem, which I love. I love Sonia Sanchez as well. But the, the poem that she read about remembering love Y'all, hold up. Let me get it for y'all because it is it's really so beautiful that I feel like this one needs to be needs to be repeated to everybody. I am looking at music. It is the color of light, the shape of sound high in the evergreens. It lies suspended in hills, a blue line in the red sky. I am looking at sound. I'm hearing the brightness of high bluffs and almond trees. I'm tasting the wilderness of lakes, rivers, and streams, caught in an angle of song. I'm remembering water that glows in the dawn, the motion tumbled in earth, life hidden in mounds. I am dancing a bright beam of light. I am remembering love. Y'all, it's literally one of the best poems. Like, and I say that because for me, I remember like there was this picture um, of like the forest in my parents' bathroom when I was a kid. And I used to always look up at this picture. And it's a reason why I'll have pictures of the forest because there is something so endless and peaceful and serene and godlike about it. There is something so uh, big and um, scary, but safe feeling about nature right so the way she writes the poem I'm looking at music you know but it's the it's the color of light it, it, it's described as what I see in nature the beauty of that and how I can add that to how sound and music and love and those things kind of come all together and I think it's the perfect way to take pieces from the memory and put them all together. Because for me, when I remember certain things that make me feel good, um, that are about nature, it is also connected to a feeling. It's also connected to a feeling of, of safeness. That's why I said, you know, it makes me think about that picture that used to be in my parents' bathroom because I'm a kid. So I have this feeling of safety in this space. And I can literally just sit there and stare at that picture and hear birds and, and water and trees whistling and feel like it is the most peaceful place that I could be in. So this poem reminds me of what that feeling is. And when you put that with this movie and the visuals of this movie and their relationship, almost like basically saying that their love was an act of nature. And saying that, you know, a love is an act of nature means that it is destiny. It is something that cannot be fucked with, for lack of a better term. You see what I'm saying? Like something that's meant to be something that is so genetic. You know what I'm saying? And I say that because I feel like it's down to the DNA. You know what I'm saying? Like what your attraction to or your feeling for this person can entail. And I think that's what's being described. Something forever something deep something that transcends in the same way that nature does in the same way that peace does in the same way you know that all of those descriptive things kind of melt together in your mind they are forever in the way that love can be forever you see what I'm saying so it's it's putting the feeling with the picture I hope that makes sense to y'all because I feel like I'm tangent <laughs> I'm going on a tangent and I'm, and I'm saying things that may not necessarily connect, and I hope that they do. It makes sense in my mind, but sometimes it's hard for me to explain those types of feelings that I have about, you know, visuals and sounds and music and how those things can procure a feeling for me. So the poem is one of those, one of those things where I feel like it's words, but it describes a picture for me. You know what I'm saying? And, and that picture creates a feeling, and then you add it with the, you know, the music part of it and the love part of it. The poem was for the movie, essentially, like active nature with all of these different influences to create the feeling. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that is what mm, figured it out. That's this movie. 
That's why the movie doesn't connect in this very fluid way, but you still love it if you love it because you're feeling all of the shapes, the sounds, the light. You know what I'm saying? Like, just like that poem, it's like all of these little pieces that I've picked up. You know what I'm saying? And I put it together and it doesn't give you the complete story, but it gives you enough for you to get the feeling of it. You know what I'm saying? So I, I feel like the poem in some way is representative of the way the movie relates, which is an amazing thing to be able to do. You know what I'm saying? Whether I can't remember whether the poem was done for Love Jones or whether it was done before and just featured in Love Jones. I can't remember because they use another Sonia Sanchez poem when they were walking and she talks about uh, the one where, you know, I take all the memories and spread them across our bed at night. I breathe you and become high. That shit. Love that one. But yes, yeah, so after, after, you know, she finishes the poem. One line she said before she started, she says, it's so funny what you can do in front of a room full of people that you can't seem to do in front of one person. So it showed how even though she seemed fearless in her relationship with Darius, there was a fear to be honest about how she felt about him. And I think they both were living in that space. So after she reads the poem and she walks out, throws the book in the garbage can like, I've said it, I'm done, I let it go, right? But she's outside and Darius is across the street and she's about to get into the taxi, it's pouring down raining. And he says, Nina. And she runs across to him and they stand under like this overpass. He tells her that he loves her and that's urgent like a motherfucker. And she's like, I live in New York. He said, I don't care. I don't care where you are. I'm going to be wherever you at. Like, that's basically what it was. And when he finally told her he loved her, and she said she loved him too, she mouthed it to him after they kissed with all of this, like, water and rain falling around them and that motherfucking John Coltrane song. And, like, you know, that kiss in the rain and I love you and that's urgent like a motherfucker. Like, y'all, ugh. At the end of the day, if you don't love me like a 90s, <laughs> like a 90s soundtrack bitch from a, a all black cast, I don't know what to tell you if you don't love me like this. Okay, y'all, I love this movie so much. And I think that it's like the, the, the perfect movie to talk about like young people falling in love with each other and trying to navigate what it's like to have people outside of you affecting how you feel, your past relationships, and just how we can get in the way of real love and real connection because we're scared to be honest about how we feel. And I think that that's one of the things people should really stop doing. I think it was one of the things that helped me deal with my feelings is when I could be more honest about it. I would say I'm sad instead of saying I'm angry. I would say I'm hurt instead of getting mad and wanting to be petty and, you know, feeling played. You know, I think that there's something to be said when you can be honest in relationships with people and say exactly how you feel. It, it creates a space for them to be able to do the same. You see what I'm saying? You know, but it's always like one person has to be the one to create the safe space sometimes to just say it, take the risk and then see how the other person responds. And I feel like I've often been that person because I am so fearless in the way that I love. Um... I learned that early on, like rejection is a part of life. And I've always felt like I can deal with rejection. So shoot the shot, try. Oh, you don't want me. I'm not your type, whatever. Somebody else gonna want me. Somebody else is type. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like it is, it, it's really the way everybody should think about relationships. Like you can be beautiful, you can be handsome, but you're not going to always be everybody's cup of tea. And even if you are sexually attractive to most people, every relationship isn't going to work because everybody's energies and personalities don't always gel and mesh. And the things that we want for ourselves aren't always conducive for a relationship to grow. So ultimately, all relationships are like a fit to see, like a try on to see if it fits. Sometimes they fit, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they fit at first and we grow out of them. And sometimes they grow with us and we keep figuring out a way to, to fit into it, you know? So I think it just depends. But I think no matter what, it should always be 
love freely. You know what I'm saying? And in love in a way that you can be honest. And then if people take your, your honesty and they can't deal with it or, you know, you being honest about your feelings and, and they feel like they can use that, you just have to trust your intuition. But I think being honest about how you feel and first of all, knowing how you feel and then being able to be honest about it, I think will save you a lot of heartache in life. If you can just be real with yourself about what your feelings are. And I think that was their main issue was that they couldn't be honest with themselves or each other about their feelings. And then when they finally were honest, honestly were, you know, finally were real and honest with their feelings, then we get the the proverbial happily ever after, which we know is not real. But I think in every moment, there is a happily ever after in the moment, in the story. You know what I'm saying? And then we go on to the next portion of it. And will there be a happily ever after to this chapter? You know what I mean? But I think this movie is beautiful because it depicted two real people in a relationship in a time being affected by the world, being affected by their past, but even more greatly being affected by what they were able to create in their relationship, how they made each other feel, you know? And I think this movie just showed how beautiful relationships can be, even with the ups and downs. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, y'all. I hope that this was... um a good review. I hope that you guys enjoyed this portion of Now That We're Grown. I definitely think I'm going to be doing soul food next. But yeah, y'all, it was a trial and a tribulation, but I did not want this recording or, you know, the playback and all of that. I didn't want it to have all of those glitches and issues. So I decided to go ahead and premiere it to you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed putting this together for y'all and, and looking at it and even having this conversation because I feel like usually I'll make notes and then as I go out, the things will reveal themselves to me, the the meaning in it, you know? So I hope I was able to translate that. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed. I can't wait to do this again. And hopefully next time we'll be able to do it live. But if not, we're going to keep it going anyway. I hope y'all enjoyed. Like, comment, subscribe. Check out my website, bondybluesshow.com. And I will see y'all in the next one.